Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, I would strongly encourage, if you want, come closer. Stay where you are, wherever you're comfortable. My name is Bruce Tobin, and I'm the Senior Director of Scientific Affairs for Acreva Diagnostics. And I thank you very much for staying with me, hopefully, for the next half hour. When we talk actually about a procedure that I'm sure all of you do, procedure that's been going on for over 60 decades, or six decades, um, and that is uh, capillary blood draw from a stick of the infant's heel. So you may think to yourself, if this procedure has been going on for at least six decades or longer, what is there new? Why even have you know, a, t a talk? And I hope to enlighten you on some, um, on some new and interesting uh, studies that have been recently done, and maybe to get you to think a little bit more about the details about the procedure that I think we all take for granted and that we do continuously all the time. So to start with, uh, just to, to let you know, and for full disclosure, again, I am employed by Creva Diagnostics. Uh, we are the manufacturer of point-of-care devices that are used for uh, coaximetry, for coagulation, for platelet function. We're also the manufacturer of incision devices such as Tenderfoot. And uh, lastly, also to let you know that I expect that this lecture is really going to be uh, vendor neutral. I just want to bring some clinical and scientific information to you so that you can at least be uh, better informed consumers. Uh, so when you're doing the procedure, hopefully always thinking about that newborn at the other end of, wh of what you're doing. And before I get started, I also want to really tell you from the bottom of my heart, I've been a respiratory therapist for many, 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 many years. <laughs> For uh, over 25 years, I practiced respiratory care in a hospital in Philadelphia and was uh, directly involved with uh, newborn care. And I really, really am humbled, and I mean that sincerely, because you are the most dedicated patient care advocates that I've ever seen. And uh, I've worked with uh, at very large hospitals, very small hospitals, worked in the operating room, worked in pulmonary function testing, outpatient area. But I have to say neonatal nurses are the, the epitome of a patient advocate. So I'm really happy to be able to talk to you today and at least present maybe some new and different information. The things that I'm going to talk about today, I wanted to start off very briefly talking about different types of samples and different laboratory tests uh, that we're doing all the time. Um, things that I'd like you to consider before you are doing the, the heel stick such as the location, the depth, the trigger device, puncture versus incision of the devices. And let me just see a raise of hands for a moment. How many are warming the heel? Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about to warm or not to warm, okay? Because there is some controversy I want you to be aware of. Uh, we'll talk just briefly about the heel stick procedure. You, I know, are more expert than I. You're doing it all the time. We'll talk about some complications, but really to bring your attention not to the short-term co uh, complications, but to those that are uh, embedded in that newborn and many, many years uh, from when that stick was made, some of the complications that eventually uh, uh, could generate in that child. And lastly, what actually makes a quality specimen? We'll talk a little bit about squeezing the heel, talk a little bit about making sure that the sample is artifact-free, free of uh, uh, tissue fluid, and lastly, the pain and trauma that sometimes the, uh, the, the child ensues because of what we do. So to start with, the different, uh, obviously, blood samples uh, that, that we take for different reasons. Uh, going, if you will, to the most, most extreme, UACs. Uh, UACs are really where we're going to get that true oxygenation uh, area, whereas a venous sample or a capillary sample is really not going to be able to reliably trend. It is not um, accurate, uh, especially when we get to a peripheral sample, and most definitely when we get to a uh, capillary sample. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, and is really um, the, one of the, the few areas that, is from an arterial perspective, that we need to have a true sample. That is for oxygen content, percent oxyhemoglobin, and for PO2. 
Venous samples are, if you will, the standard of, of care for routine chemistries. They are the only uh, standard for coagulation tests. Okay, so if you're running uh, PTs, APTTs, or other type of coag, possibly um, ACTs for children that are on ECMO, okay? Uh, that's only a, a venous sample uh, is, is required. Your typical H and H's, or if you're doing coaximetry, for example, for percent met hemoglobin in children that are on nitric oxide, where they get a sample at least once a day or more periodically than that, uh, venous sample is uh, definitely uh, a, uh, one of the preferred methods. How about capillary? How about a heel stick? What is that good for? Okay, so it is a surrogate oftentimes to other type of lab tests, but it is not a surrogate or able to be used for all different type of lab tests. So just for example, if you're going to do a blood culture, you're not going to be able to do that from a heel stick, right? If you're going to uh, do, again, coagulation studies, you can't do that by a heel stick. But what is heel sticks good for? They are good for routine chemistries. You can get a reliable percent met hemoglobin for your children that are on nitric oxide. Um, there are 400, or excuse me, 4 million babies that are born in the United States, at least as of last year. Every single one of them, plus more, got a heel stick, at least for the PKU or for uh, metabolic studies. We know that. Whether they're in your unit or the one that's left of you, which is the, I'll say, your normal well baby nursery, right? Or those children that are born at home, it's a state requirement for the metabolic studies and the PKU. What you may or may not know is with those studies, it is the, the state decides what studies are actually done. So some states, it's a total of maybe about 20 to 26 studies, other states up to 40. So that's state dependent. Uh, but again, it's, it's a state regulated from the uh, Department of Health uh, from that unique uh, 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 location. The topic really is heel sticks. Heel sticks provide capillary blood, but I want to give you just a better appreciation of where that blood is coming from and why it is good but not good for other types of studies. So if you take a look at this diagram up here, when you do your heel stick and you get, capillary, get a capillary sample, you don't know if you're on this side, if you're on this side, or right in the middle. And that's why we say that for oxygenation purposes, if you needed a PO2, if you needed a percent oxyhemoglobin or an oxygen content, you can't use a capillary sample because you don't know from which end of that capillary loop you're going to be able to uh, uh, get that blood. In addition, most oxygenation studies are used not only for their individual value, but for trending. So if on one stick you just happen to get it closer to the arterial side, you can't guarantee that on your next stick. And if you're then going to trend that information, you can get false or erroneous trending, which could lead, lend your patient management one way or the other. So we don't use capillary sticks for oxygenation measurement. On the other hand, it is a reliable measurement to trend PCO2. Okay? Now, I know there are non-invasive methods to do the same thing. You know, there are uh, not only pulse oximeters, there are uh, CO2 monitors, end tidal CO2 monitors, also transcutaneous. Uh, but you can use a capillary sample not only for PCO2 measurements, but also for, uh, for pH. There is very little difference between a venous capillary and arterial pH. And that trending is extremely reliable, and that's well documented in the literature as well. So this is the area, this cross section right here is where we're trying to stick. Usually uh, has a diameter that is only allowing one blood, blood cell to go through at a time. This happens to be a red blood cell. Center of, of it is hemoglobin. But I think you can appreciate, at least from the upper diagram, that every time you stick the heel, you may get a different value depending on what side of that center line you're going in. So which type of blood samples, which type of blood tests are most reliable for capillary samples? Those that it doesn't make a difference, such as your H&Hs, such as your CBCs, 
such as your met hemoglobins or, um, or those type of tests that are exactly the same if it's arterial or venous or capillary. I know that everyone in this room has seen this diagram one way or another. What I did at home just the other day is I traced on top the arterial circulation because sometimes you don't see that. And I really do think that that's important, that to know where the medial plantar artery is and the lateral plantar artery is uh, in relationship to those shaded areas that we're actually going to stick. Okay, um, it's obviously very important that when we do a heel puncture, uh, we are not only do we not go over an existing scar or an edematous area or where a previous heel puncture originally was, but we also want to make sure that we're away from all the major vessels. And that is the primary reason why this shaded area has always been the ideal location, especially on the lateral surface of it. The, um, one of the things that I want to bring your attention to is in the third bullet. Heel stick is made with a self-retracting blade. Is anybody in the room still using the old-fashioned lancets? Right? Okay, right. They're verboten, right? We don't use them. Not only are they no good for the child, because you can never get a precise depth. You can never get, a, you know, a, um, uh, oftentimes you're going down, you're, you're hitting the heel bone, the caniculus, but it's, um, for you, the operator, you are now exposed to that sharp blade and you can get uh, injured as well. So in the United States, as well as through most of the world, the health regulations are requiring now self-retracting uh, incision devices or, or heel puncture type of devices. You may not be familiar with this cross section. This is a cross section of a, a term uh, infant. Um, and what I'd like to bring to your attention is the area of the capillary loop and where the pain fibers start. You'll notice that the pain fibers start directly underneath of where the capillary bed is. And for most of um, term infants, we're looking uh, somewhere between about 0.35 and 0.82 millimeters, something that we can't really eyeball, okay? Another reason why we don't want to use a manual lancet device, there's no way that we can identify you know, how to get there. So what happens if you go too shallow? What if your depth is not deep enough? Then you're going to get really minimal to no blood flow, and you're going to be there squeezing and squeezing and squeezing, which is not good not only for the quality of sample, because you're going to be putting tissue artifact in that sample, but it's going to be very painful for the child. Okay, And that complication is everything that we're trying to avoid. What happens if you go too deep? If you go too deep, you start getting into the pain fibers. Okay? How many of you have recently, or maybe a month ago, did a heel puncture and the child cried? Right? Okay. Why did they cry? Did they cry because of the tactile you know, stimulation? Did they cry because you're moving their foot around? Or did they cry because you got down to the pain fibers? Okay? Now, something that obviously we don't want to do, but is it possible really to avoid that? Question that at the end we'll see a raise of hands if you know the answer to that. So this is a standard guide for depth of, uh, of, of, uh, of a heel stick. You'll notice that the guide is based on infant weight, that those uh, uh, micro preemies and preemies and term babies, uh, the depth of the, um, uh, of the guide gets larger, actually you go deeper as the weight of the baby increases. That makes a lot of sense. I can guarantee you if I took my shoe off right now and you went to stick me with a newborn incision device, it wouldn't bleed at all. In fact, I probably wouldn't feel it. I have so much calluses on the bottom of my heels. Um, so obviously as the, uh, as the infant uh, is uh, at a very, very low birth weight, as the infant is more and more uh, premature, then the depth from the surface to where that capillary bed changes, and that gets narrower, and we have to always think about that. Now, most of us really don't remember these numbers, but most of us know if I'm working in the well baby nursery, I might be using a heel incision device that has this color, 
okay? Maybe, maybe a, a, a blue and, and a pink color. But I know if I'm working in the uh, neonatal intensive care unit, working with a 24 or 25 week you know, uh, preemie, I'm not going to use that pink and that blue, I'm gonna use maybe the pink and the pink, or the white and the white, or whatever color combinations the manufacturers have. Why? Because manufacturers make different depths of their, uh, of their stick device, whether it be uh, for puncture or incision, and you don't necessarily want to go next door if you run out to get somebody else's because it might be of a different depth. All right. So that's why um, I put this depth uh, chart over here. Some of you may not be familiar that there is a length criteria. And the length criteria are for those devices that make not just a puncture or a downward uh, stick, but they may make a lateral incision. So uh, this is, uh, is usually less familiar with people. Usually they understand that there's a different depth. And again, that depth is all usually from the manufacturer a color-coded device. So um, again, I caution you, if you are commonly using, a, again, a pink and a pink, and now somebody from uh, materials management comes up and says, yep, we just got the new shipment of devices, here they are, and you see they're pink and they're blue, raise your hand, okay? Something is not right. It's not that the manufacturer has changed their color, but maybe the materials management brought up the wrong box or they ordered the wrong product, okay? So if you get something that's too shallow, you're going to have to restick that child many times. If you get something that is too deep, you can cause a lot of complications, um, even osteochondritis. Uh, the inflammation of uh, an infection of, of the bone in the heel. There are some design features that are very important to appreciate when manufacturers make heel stick devices. One is the location of the trigger. How could this make a difference? The other is the pun a puncture versus an incision. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on that because I want to show you that it's not just a cute little idea, where do we put the trigger or how do we actually make the foot bleed, but it actually makes a difference in the long run. What I'd like everybody to do is take their left hand. There we go. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Hold it like this. Take your right hand. Do this. Just press in a little bit. Is your skin moving? Yeah. Now imagine if that was an infant's heel, okay? A preemie's heel, a full-term infant's heel. That's probably going to move a lot more than your, than your thumb and your first finger. Would you agree? Okay. So if the device that you're using has a trigger on the top, in order to depress that trigger, and actuate the blade that's coming out, that takes a little bit of force. Not a lot of force, you know, we're not really pushing down, but you have to press the trigger down, right? When you press the trigger down, when you are causing a downward force, not only to depress the trigger, but all the way through the device that's actually compressing the skin. So, if you desired to, um, to stick the infant's heel, let's say 0.8 millimeters, and you used a device with a downward trigger, and when you press that down, in order to actuate that blade, you're going to be going a lot deeper than 0.8 millimeters. Would that make sense? Okay. There are devices that have their trigger on the side. In order to actuate that blade and you push in on that trigger, where's the pressure going? It's going laterally. It's not going down. You're not indenting the skin. You're not compressing the area. So if you wanted to go down 0.8 millimeters or 0.6 millimeters, depending on the device that you're using, by having a lateral trigger, you are not compromising and adding more depth to the blade. 
very, very important because, again, just like you can press down right, right here and that moves, just a little bit of pressure moving what? Two, three millimeters, right? So you can imagine as you are compressing that heel, that blade is getting closer and closer and closer, not only to the nerve endings, but also to the bone. Most self-retracting heel stick devices come in one of two design features, to either puncture the skin or to cause a skin incision. Let's look at a puncture. What is a puncture? A puncture is taking one of those manual lancets, putting it into an automated device. How does that work? Well, they all have a little sharp point at the end, which has to be able to pierce the skin. But the cutting blade is over here. It's laterally. It's above where the point is. Okay? This is what's actually cutting the capillary loops. So in order to effectively get enough blood flow, in order to effectively get enough blood volume for a quality sample, you have to cut significant amount of those capillary loops. But the device, a puncture device, has to go deeper than where those capillary loops are to get the blade in the area to cut them. Does that make sense? So if yesterday, last week, last month, you did a puncture and the child cried, it may be because that in order to get the sample, this had to get down to the nerve endings, the, the tip. Okay. So what is the other devices that create an incision? They're basically a scalpel blade and rather than coming down at a 90 degree angle, they actually go in a sweeping arc movement so that the very, very tip of the, the blade actually is what is cutting through the loops as it's literally doing this. Okay? So if you're trying then to get down to, let's say, 0.8 millimeters or 0.6 millimeters, and you're using the correct device, you don't have to go deeper than what is necessary. You don't have to get near those nerve endings. You don't have to get near the caniculus, the, the heel bone in which to do it. Because again, the maximum depth that this is going as it's swinging across is right in the optimal area where that capillary bed is. So there's more that meets the eye with these self-retracting devices. Again, two issues that you may not have been aware of that can cause the blade to go deeper out of the optimized area into the area of where the pain fibers are into the area that is getting closer uh, to the bone. And that is where the trigger is located and are you using a puncture device or are you using a incision type device. talk a little bit. Before uh, we started, I asked how many are warming the heel. And there was a number of, of people that raised their hands. So um, I will tell you, um, more years that I want to admit, when I was in school, we all warmed the heel. Why did we warm the heel? Because that's what we were told to do. Why were we told to do that? Because that's what was in the textbook. Who put it in the textbook? Nobody ever really knows. But what scientific studies were ever done to show that warming heel is a good thing? It sounds like a good thing, right? So if you actually go into the procedures for arterializing the blood, arterializing the blood means that you're trying to increase the, the vascular flow, you're trying to increase or actually even dilate the capillaries to make it look more arterial. And the reason why we did this is because when blood gases start to become very, very um, uh, um, available and common in the late 60s and early 70s, and we start to do more uh, infant neonatal ventilation, we start to do you know, um, more CPAP and PEEP and, and all of the, uh, the initials that make up the alphabet, right? You know them you know, as, as well as I do. Uh, what we were trying to do is find ways of getting that blood gas, especially that PO2. 
So what better way in which to maybe dilate the capillaries, increase the blood flow, and bring them closer to the surface, hopefully, and that's what arterializing the blood is supposed to do. How do we do it? What's the procedure? Well, the procedure is that we warm the infant's heel three to five minutes before the actual procedure starts at approximately 40 degrees C. We uh, never exceed 42, and we never, ever, ever put a damp cloth in a microwave and heat that, right? It doesn't happen. Let's just talk about the different heel warming devices just for a moment. Um, when I was originally trained, it was a warm washcloth, right? You, you put it under the, the sink for a while, you're, you're, you're wrung it out so you wouldn't, so the nurses wouldn't blame us for wetting the bed. <laughs> you wrap it around, you know, uh, the, the foot, and you left it on there for a couple minutes, right? It's damp. You then take it off. The heel is now damp, yes? What happens to the cooling when water evaporates? Or what happens to temperature as water evaporates? It causes cooling, right? So if you uh, pick your finger in your mouth and held it up, your finger is now going to be cooler than the rest of your hand. Why? Because the energy that it takes to cause evaporation, it's called the latent heat of vaporization, actually removes heat from the skin, which then cools the skin. So in our attempt to literally warm the heel, which it may do, the moment we take off that damp compress, not only does the heel start to cool, but now those capillary beds, if they were coming to the surface, has now gone back down and maybe have gotten even narrower. So depending on cost, depending on your facility, you may have done away with the, uh, the wash rags, right? You may have gone to the, the heel packs, right? Where you, you crush the chemical, you twist it, it stays about 40 degrees, and it doesn't cause cooling when you take it off, right? So that's what a lot of people have gone to. Uh, very effective because they're not going to get over 42 degrees. They're really not going to cause thermal injuries uh, to your children. So we, we secure those around the plantar surface of the foot and you perform the heel stick per policy, right? Everybody has a policy. So my question to you is, was there ever a scientific study to prove or disprove that arterializing the blood actually works? The answer is yes. There have been. There's been at least three, and uh, they are very, very uh, available in the literature. So what does the scientific evidence show? The objective clinical evidence shows that not only does it not increase blood flow and blood volume, but in some studies it actually shows it decreases it. Okay? Might even decrease it. But the overwhelming objective evidence, scientific studies of over four to five hundred children independently warm, not warm, with the chemical packs, not the damp cloth, show that there is absolutely no effect of blood flow or blood volume if, and that's the caveat, if you're using the correct uh, device for the correct depth using the correct procedure. Okay, so what do we actually know about the heel warming devices? Well, we know for the scientific evidence, it doesn't improve blood flow, it doesn't do what's called arterializing the blood. But we do know, by nature of what we have to do, it delays getting a blood test. We know by the nature of what we do, it does add additional cost. Now, maybe not if you're using the washcloths and the water, but the heel packs cost money, right? Um, but we do know that if you use the correct size and design, that um, you can get a quality sample. That's actually the second time I've used that phrase, quality sample. And part of the characteristics of a quality sample is that first, you get good blood flow, you get a decent amount of volume to send to the laboratory. Second thing you know about quality blood flow is that you cause minimal to no pain for the baby. The next thing is that you don't have to re-stick the baby, which is now going to cause that baby to get even more frustrated with you being at the bedside, right? And the last thing is you want to be able to correct or collect a capillary sample that you don't have to squeeze the heel. 
because when you squeeze the heel, two things are going to happen. You're going to get tissue artifact coming out in the superficial layers of the skin that's going to go into your capillary sample. The lab is then either going to not be able to um, uh, analyze the blood or it's going to give you artifact and erroneous readings and the stick may have to be repeated. But the second thing that squeezing the heel is going to do is cause pain. In fact, it is the second most common reason that of the causing an increase in pain for children with heel sticks. The first, the first reason for causing pain is getting a puncture device that's getting close to the nerve endings. Squeezing the heel is the second. So, if you are using a device that is not effectively cutting the capillary loops, you as clinicians may not have a choice. You may need to give a little squeeze. You may need to cause a little bit, little bit of pain, right? Because the last thing you want to do is restick the baby again. Believe it or not, your materials management people, they don't want you to restick the baby either. Do you know why? Because they've calculated one stick per baby. How many of you had to do more than one stick per baby ever? Okay, so you've now just doubled your cost. So it's not just the cost of the single device, but factor in what is the average number of re-sticks because you didn't get a quality sample. That then is your true price. Throw on top of that if you have to use a heel warmer. Pretty pictures, we have them for sale. <laughs> um, Obviously, disinfect. All devices have a trigger guard. That's for your protection, OK? Um, position the device in the correct location. Never go within two millimeters of a previous stick. Never go in an area of a demitis area. Never go in an area that might look infected, right? You want to go into a clean spot, right? Um, you wipe off the first drop. Why do we wipe off the first drop again? Again, tissue artifact. We want to make sure that the sample is 100% blood and not the infiltrated uh, tissue um, and fluid that, that might come from that. And then you either have a capillary tube, you have your, your Guthrie uh, test card, uh, you may have a tiny little uh, cone-shaped uh, capillary device that you, know, you put it into. But one thing that I will ask you not to do is don't touch those containers. Don't touch the card to where you just made that wound there should be a slight separation, okay? You never want to uh, actually touch that wound site with your device, even with a capillary tube. You wait till a ball comes out in the end, you hold it slightly away, and through capillary action, uh, that glass tube uh, should fill. Uh, there we go. So here's some tech tips for you. First tech tip, um, raise the baby's foot a little bit above the heart level, okay? You'll get better. Um, a better quality sample. As I mentioned a moment ago, uh, stay uh, at least uh, two millimeters away from a prior stick. Don't go into an area where there's a scar or edema. Um, place the blade slot flush against the, the surface of the heel. Right? Make it, but do not indent. Right? It should be placed firmly there, but without any indentation and making sure that where the blade slot comes out is centered right where you want to make that uh, incision. Uh, again, do not squeeze or milk the heel. Just think of the pain that that's causing. Um, do not make direct wound contact. Um, uh, make sure that um, afterwards you're putting a little pressure on that area to avoid any hematomas. Um, not a good thing. Um, a lot of controversy at the very end after you, you hold it, do you put like, you know, a, a band-aid dot there, right? Uh, many hospitals do not do it. Um, two reasons why many hospitals don't. One is because you want to observe that site, you want to look for uh, problems, complications afterwards, and if you are, you know, covering that area, you'll never see it. Another reason why hospitals don't want to do it is because it might come off and there's always that case of aspiration, maybe not in the neonatal you know, uh, children who are intubated, obviously, and things like that, but you don't want it laying around the bed. Um, and, uh, and obviously also for the skin sensitivity, um, and you don't want to rip off the skin when you're 
peeling off the Band-Aid. Uh, so a lot of hospitals do not uh, cover that anymore. And lastly, monitor the site. Okay, just because you think you did a great job doesn't mean that something is going to, uh, that you won't get an infection every once in a while, about one out of every hundred children, you might get a, a slight infection, and we want to uh, uh, reduce that possibility and at least get, observe it as quick as possible so it can be taken care of. So I'm not really sure if, how well you can see it. I, I, will, um, I will tell you that that's my granddaughter who's now two years old. <laughs> um, but uh, this is a child who had a puncture, uh, got a little bit too deep. Uh, you'll notice that it is uh, inflamed, it, it is a little bit edematous. Uh, my granddaughter, her name is Jocelyn, had uh, two different punctures. Uh, and you can see th this, this was done actually with one of those incision devices. So when you take a look at the skin, rather than seeing a hole, if you will, right? If you would take a, a pen mark right down, you don't see that with the incision devices, you actually see a line. Because remember I told you with the incision devices, you have that sweeping arc, right? So uh, this is what an incision device would look like, and this is 24 hours and 96 hours uh, post blood collection. You'll see at least at the 96 hours, you may barely be able to see that line, okay? They heal very nicely, again, you're looking at a double hone st sterile st surgical blade as opposed to a device that is going to poke through the skin. And that's why they heal differently, okay? They heal very much different. All right, so when we look at the complications, obviously the bruising, the infection, the localized or general necrosis, uh, osteochondritis, those are one group of um, of complications, but what I also want to spend some time on right now is talking about a complication that most people don't understand that it is truly a complication, and that is the crying, the pain, or the stress, okay? For the average, I'll say, lay individual, the mom or the dad, the grandparents, if they're by the bedside and you have to do a heel stick and the baby cries, they say, look, I've had a vena puncture before, I've stubbed my toe before, I know it hurts, it goes away, it's no big deal. That is not the case for newborns, especially those who are very, very, very sick. We know that the crying, just the change in the ventilatory function, will, will immediately change the synchrony of the ventilation pattern if they were mechanical support, they are not getting the ventilation, they're not getting the CO2 clearance, they're not getting the oxygenation. We know that if they are asynchronous with those uh, with mechanical ventilation, the ultimately what happens is your cerebral blood pressure will increase as well as your systemic and your pulmonary um, uh, blood pressure will also change. Think of the children with um, um, uh, uh, PDAOs, think of the children with PPHN, those children, if they increase their inner thoracic pressure, look what's happening to their shunt, okay? Look what's happening to their, their cardiac output. Think about what's happening to their, uh, their oxygen content and their oxygen circulation if you, uh, if you re expand some of those uh, intracardiac shunts or major vessel shunts, okay? That happens when children cry, especially those who are pre premature with congenital defects, okay? Uh, very, very well documented, and it's because of crying. It, crying is not an innocuous issue, okay? It may be in us, but not in the sick children that you take care of every single day. Um, what about the long-term complications of crying, the long-term complications of pain and stress? very well documented. In fact, about uh, six months ago, there was an excellent article uh, that came out, um, I believe it was a, a, a British journal uh, of neonatology, where they talked about cognitive changes. They talked about as that child gets older and, uh, and, and a lot of the hormonal and enzymatic changes that occur when that older child gets pain, all referring back to some of the stimulation that they got in the neonatal intensive care unit. We look actually about epigenetic changes of things that actually 
uh, when that child becomes a teenager and an adult, how they respond to pain, all because of consistent uh, deep pain that occurred when they were, uh, let's say, a, a preemie, and the, uh, the, uh, the procedures that we do to them that have caused pain. So there's not only what I call these short-term complications and maybe medium-term complications that have some clinical effect directly to you at the bedside, but when that child leaves your unit and that child goes home and starts school and goes into high school later on, some of those um, changes that occur and how they respond to pain and their effect of pain all started back uh, at the newborn area. So I want to close with a summary slide, and that is talking about the characteristics of a quality heel stick. The first is a quality heel stick should have the characteristic of having sufficient blood volume to satisfy all the lab test requirements without repeating the stick. If you do a quality stick, you shouldn't have to repeat it. Next, the procedure should produce ample blood flow without the need to squeeze the heel. Again, squeezing your heel is not going to cause pain. In fact, at night, that's maybe a really good thing if you've been on your feet for a while, but not for a newborn, not for a preemie, not for a child with a diaphragmatic hernia, not for a child with a ventilator. We don't want to squeeze their heels. Um, you want to do it with minimal to no overt signs of, uh, of pain. And lastly, no residual uh, trauma or complications such as bruising or infection. So I want to leave you, if you will, with this last thought that a quality stick is not just your technique, but it's things that you may not have been aware of before that not all the devices, the self-retracting devices are made the same. Think about where that trigger is. Think about this when you go back to, to your unit. Think about if you're making a puncture that actually has to go deeper than where the blade is to cut the capillary loops. Those are very, very important features that ultimately um, uh, give you a, a quality uh, stick as pain-free as possible and a child that will eventually leave your unit and grow up to be a, a, half, a very happy and normal individual. So I want to thank you for your paying attention. I thank you for what you do. Very special people. Thank you again.